I'm Francis Levy, co-director of the Phil Teddy Center. Ed Nersessian is the other co-director, sitting right across the way there. Uh, and before we begin this afternoon's program, I have a question. How many of you would like to see Tarkovsky's Solaris this summer? <laughs> well, last, last week I announced that, that Jean Renoir was going to be our, our summer film festival, our chamber film festival, and we love Jean Renoir, but we had this inspired idea to do a Tarkovsky series. So uh, keep your eye on our philiptades.org site, the calendar, because it may be three Tarkovsky films uh, highlighted by starting with Solaris on the 14th of July. Uh, before we begin the, today's program, and it's a, a program with a special meaning to me because I have a faint desire to sort of inhabit just one string a little bit to the east or west of the current universe I occupy. I just want things to be a slight bit different. <laughs> and maybe the panelists could help me in, a, in, a, in that regard. Um, but uh, this is the last uh, program of our current season. We have a very exciting season coming up next year. Uh, we do want to remind you that Philoctetes depends on you for support. I say this incredibly seriously. We've been very, very successful in getting grants from all kinds of foundations, the New York State Council on the Arts, in poetry and music, Department of Cultural Affairs. I've said those of you who've come here, you've heard this ad nauseum. But uh, we need, we depend on individual contributions to survive because those those grants only relate to specific programs. Now the the current art exhibit, which you'll see here for the very last time, is called Hive, Web, and Mind, Animal Nests and Human Networks. And if you look up at the ceiling, there are actual hives. There's a hive outside, there's a hive there. And for those of you who are interested, who are anaphylactically, yeah, if you're anaphylactically inclined or disposed, there's no real wasps. <laughs> But all our exhibits, just to tell you a little bit about Philip Tades, relate to round tables. And this particular exhibit was uh, developed by Hallie Cohen and Adam Ludwig in conjunction with our social networking round table on February 1st. David Kirkpatrick, you may have seen the book, The Facebook Effect, um, was the moderator of that round table. And Sean Parker, who was one of the founders of Facebook, was here. So we, we had a very exciting round table about social networking. And then we kind of, Hallie and Adam kind of tried to deal with this kind of on an, both an organic and cybernetic level. So the artists, you know, approach the, the whole question of the representation of networking in a whole other mode. In any case, now I'm very pleased to present Paul Park. Paul Park has written 11 novels and a volume of short stories in a variety of genres. His most recent novella, Ghosts Doing the Orange Dance, is the January is in the fa January February edition of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. He lives in Berkshire County and teaches at Williams College. Paul Park will moderate this afternoon's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. So uh, take it away, Paul. Yeah, I j I'd like to introduce these people that I met for the first time a little while ago. This is uh, David Morgan, who's a physicist at Eugene Lang. Um, uh, Ava Bran, who's, uh, who teaches at uh, uh, St. John's College in Annapolis. Um, Krista Davis Akampur, who teaches at uh, NYU Philosophy. Hunter College Hunter Graduate College. Center. Oh, CUNY Graduate Center. Oh, then they're wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at Hunter College. And David Weinberg, who's, um, who's a cosmologist. Uh, do you teach? you teach? Ohio State. Ohio State, OK. Um, and I, what I thought. Uh, I wanted to do is start with um, the cosmologists and the physicists uh, because it's, I think, pretty clear to people um, what the attraction is uh, in terms of philosophy and fiction writing and, and simply imagining uh, to think about the uses of imagining a cosmos that would consist uh, of versions uh, different universes and versions of our own universe, um, that, that as a metaphor that has a certain kind of power. But I'd like to start by talking about uh, the potential physical reality of it, where the idea came from, whether, whether the metaphor came from the possibility or whether the possibility is playing catch up with the metaphor. Um, so I'd like to turn it, o turn it over to uh, David for a bit to see, or the, both Davids, to see if you can come up with some kind of history of the idea in physical terms. Okay. I mean, I think 
Uh, David and I are going to focus on, on two slightly different ways of thinking about parallel universes, but I think they both date, or you can both you can trace both of the, the histories back to the early part of the 20th century, and one is with Einstein and the theory of general relativity, where you start to think about our universe sort of multidimensionally, and as soon as you start thinking about our universe multidimensionally, you can start to posit a universe that's outside of our universe dimensionally in some direction that we can't perceive. Um, also, with the the Big Bang Theory uh, in the early part of the 20th century, you, when our universe stops being thought of as infinite or space, infinite in space and time, you can start imagining an outside to that universe, right? Well, if the universe is infinite, then it's all that there can be. But if it's finite, then there can be universes before and after and, and outside of it. And so there's that aspect of sort of being able to think outside of a universe um, if that universe is finite in space and time. And then in, in quantum mechanics, um, in the sort of 1920s and 1930s, when we start thinking about the universe as not being strictly deterministic, but being probabilistic. Uh, in other words, there are things that happen in the universe that could happen this way or could happen that way in a way that's not determined by the laws of physics. Um, you start being able to think about the universe in terms of it's possible that it could have come out some different way. So instead of the universe being causally determined every instant from the instant before, there are places where choices can be made. And that leads you to um, things like the modern interpretation of quantum mechanics called the many worlds theory, which is that our universe is all the time sort of making choices that lead to a superposition of a nearly infinite number of parallel universes that exist sort of on top of our universe in some sort of metaphorical way all the time. Um, so I think there are those two different ways of thinking about parallel universes that Dave and I are going to talk about, the sort of multiple simultaneous in the same place universes that quantum mechanics talks about, and the sort of universes outside of our own in space and time that cosmologists talk about. Uh, why don't you say a little more about the many worlds first, and then I'll talk about the multi multiple universe. Um, I, uh, I'll say as much as I can about the many worlds uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, and I'll try to be fair to it because I'm not particularly fond of it as an interpretation of quantum mechanics my own self, um, but I'll, I will try to give it um, its, its due. Um, the idea in quantum mechanics is that there are some processes at the subatomic level that have uh, an outcome that's probabilistic. So if I had a radioactive, all of our bodies are full of radioactive atoms, right? You've got uh, your regular old carbon-12 atoms, but there are also some carbon-14 atoms. At any instant during this 90-minute talk today, one of those carbon-14 atoms can decay into nitrogen-14. Um, <coughs> but there's no way to tell for any particular atom when that could happen. It could happen in the next five minutes. It could happen in the next five years. It could happen in the next five million years. So every instant that Adam makes a, I'm going to use big scare quotes again, decision whether or not to decay. In other words, the universe can either turn out that that atom had decayed or it didn't decay. Um, now, the sort of standard interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics is that that atom is described by something called a wave function. And when you make an observation of that atom, you determine whether or not it has decayed or not. But many worlds says that sort of Every time that that atom has a choice to make whether or not to decay, the universe sort of splits into two possible universes, one in which that atom decayed and one in which that atom didn't decay. Um, because we're in a universe filled with trillions upon trillions upon trillions of atoms that can be doing any number of random things at any instant, that leads to an enormous number of universes sort of popping into existence. Um, and whether that existence is a real existence or just a mathematical existence is part of the arguing that goes on about how to interpret this many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. But the idea is that anything that could have possibly happened in our universe did happen in some possible universe. And those universes exist, quote unquote, parallel to one another. Now, I'm going to ask a, a kind of naive question. Is, is there any reason to believe that this is so? Um, no. And that's, that's why I'm trying to be very careful about calling it the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and not the many worlds theory. Quantum mechanics is a theory that explains what little subatomic particles do. Um, and there are some parts of that theory, particularly the randomness part and the sort of question of when, do, when does the randomness come out? Does it come out by itself? Does it come out when we make the observation? Um, that there are various interpretations of quantum mechanics, things about wave function collapse, things about complementarity, things about um, um, observers and the many worlds interpretation is one possible interpretation of what quantum mechanics means. So it's not a separate theory that makes separate predictions. Um, most people would agree with that statement, although there are some adherents to 
um, the many world series that say that it does make predictions, um, but I don't believe them and I don't feel necessarily qualified to defend them um, because some of them are pretty crazy. So there's, there, there, there's no sequence of cause and effect. The, the predictions, not the people who support uh -huh. many worlds. There's no, there's no sequence of cause and effect? Okay. Well, there's, there's, there's cause and effect, but there's, there's nothing about the universe that we happen to be in in any given moment that can distinguish the many worlds interpretation from any other interpretation because right. the universes don't interact with one. Right. Whatever universe we're in right now, that's the universe that we perceive and can measure. So there's no way to make any contact with these other potential universes that are supposedly um, being created in any given moment. So that's why it's an interpretation of a theory and not a theory in mm -hmm. and of itself because mm -hmm. it makes no predictions no that we can test. Yeah. And I think that the, um, you know, there, there definitely are physicists who think this is the right and most convincing interpretation of what quantum mechanics means. Uh, you've got the bad luck to have two physicists who aren't in, in that camp. But the, um, uh, What's the bad luck tattoo. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, oh, just that, that you know, it might have been more interesting if, if one of us happened to be a passionate advocate of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. But, um, but I think, uh, like David, I find it, uh, I don't know, to me intuitively, it just feels too crowded. Um, but the, um, uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't say there's, you know, so there's no, no arguments that, that I found convincing that this is what's really going on. Um, on the other hand, there aren't, at least as yet, uh, quantum mechanics is something which, you know, it's a, a theory of, of the world that is perfectly successful in, in predicting all sorts of things. And, and the, um, uh, so, so it's a, an extremely successful description of nature. But the harder and harder you think about it, the less and less sense it makes. Um, and, the, uh, and so this is, is one of the ways that, that, uh, that people find to make sense of it. Now, I think, um, and I think it probably is in, in terms of, of scientific ideas of parallel universes, this is probably the one that's that's most connected to, you know, a sort of popular notion of parallel universes and and the kind of notions that might appear in in science fiction, say, because these these parallel universes or that that arise in in many worlds and in interpretation of quantum mechanics are in some sense close. They're, they're branching off from one another. Um, although you know, they're, they're close, but the distance between them is, is unbridgeable for, for some reason. Um, and, the, uh, and I would distinguish that um, from, from an idea that I also don't know whether it's true, but which I do take pretty seriously, which is multiple universes. Um, but multiple universes that are are spatially very distant, and the uh, and the motivation for this uh, goes back to the the theory of inflationary cosmology, which was developed in the the early 1980s, to try to explain how how our universe could be as as big as it is and could be as as homogeneous as it is. That when you look in different parts of the universe. Uh, you see distinct structures, but, but the kind of stuff you see in this direction is like the kind of stuff you see in this direction and the kind of stuff you see in this direction. And in the standard Big Bang model, it's hard to understand that because, because those regions of the universe never had time to communicate with each other and, and know that they should be the same. Um, so, the, uh, so the idea behind inflation was that, that in the very early universe, so this is sort of 10 to the minus 30th seconds after the beginning, whatever the beginning is, um, the, the universe went through a, a period of a very rapid expansion where it was doubling in size uh, every 10 to the minus 30th seconds or so. And it did this you know, 50, 60, 100 times. And that's enough to, to grow a kind of subatomic sized uh, patch of, of the universe into something that's, that's macroscopic size. And the idea is uh, behind inflation was that, that this tiny uh, original patch would have had time to smooth itself out and communicate, and then would get blown up to this, this much bigger size that could then evolve, expand to become our, our entire observable universe. Um, and this theory 
does make some specific predictions uh, about the nature of the universe and the structures in the universe that have that uh, and those predictions have held up very well. So this is is an idea that's taken very seriously, but. If inflation is a good, uh, a good theory of our universe, then it has to end. Um, because if the universe were doubling in size every 10 to the minus 30 seconds, there wouldn't be much point in having this conversation. Um, so, the, uh, uh, so inflation has to end. And the various, there are different versions of the theory of inflation that, that basically differ in how, how this end happens, and you know, one possibility is there is basically one universe, and and uh, and it inflates, and then for some reason inflation ends, and it's it heats up, and it it becomes a sort of normal Big Bang universe. But there's a, a fairly compelling version of inflation in which actually there's there's a much bigger universe out there, and and it's inflating all the time. It's continuing to double in size every 10 to the minus 30 seconds. But there are regions within it where inflation stops um, and where things heat up and you get a uh, sort of big bang. And we live in one of those regions where inflation happened to stop. Um, but, the, uh, but sort of far beyond our observable universe, uh, and, and even the, the, that observable universe that we inhabit might even go on infinitely. Um, but then this is sort of one bubble in a uh, so-called inflationary sea. And that, this, uh, that there can be many other locations where uh, inflation also stops and where you get other Big Bang universes. Um, but, uh, but in this theory, the, the, uh, which is often referred to as, as eternal inflation, because inflation is going on forever, or as, as a multiverse theory, because there really are these, these many bubbles, uh, perhaps infinitely many bubbles, that, uh, that actually uh, appear uh, to each one to its inhabitants as a sort of self-contained universe. Um, there, there can be many of, of these out there, but they're enormously distant. They're so distant we'll never communicate with them. And what makes this idea really exotic is the possibility that, that the actual microscopic laws of physics could be different in, in all of these, these different universes, and, and particularly in, in string theory, which is one of the leading candidates for a sort of comprehensive theory of physics. Uh, the idea is there, there are many spatial dimensions that uh, there are 10 spatial dimensions, some of which get folded up so they become unobservable. But, but the ways in which they fold up actually determine the kinds of particles that exist and the forces between them. And that maybe they always fold up in one particular way, and that leads to the universe that we have. But maybe it's sort of like a house of cards that you, know, you tip it, and it can break lots of different ways. And that this happens differently for each of these different universes. And so you know, some of them have atoms and, uh, and galaxies and life, and, and others uh, you know, might have, have radically different kinds of, of things within them. Um, why do you think inflation has to stop? Is that just because of the matter would constantly be? Right. So it's just that we live in a universe that is not inflating, uh, you know, it's it's not doubling in size every every trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Um, we are today, in fact, undergoing something that's a little bit akin to inflation, but on a but much much slower. So so to to correspond to our universe. This, this very rapid doubling in size has to stop, and the universe has to get hot to produce uh, what we see as the Big Bang. So there was one other idea I wanted to, to throw in at this point. Um, you know, that's sort of multiple universes. There's parallel universes in the, uh, in the, the kind of many world sense. Um, and then another idea uh, is, is just that of, of infinite replicas in an infinite universe. So here. We could just have one universe um, that's basically the same everywhere, but that that uh, uh, but that, that goes on forever, and um, and this then leads to all sorts of disturbing paradoxes, as infinity often does, and and the. Um, uh, and in particular, so if you've uh, ever read the, the Borges story, the Library of Babel, um, you know, so the Library of Babel is this this library which is, consists of these hexagonal rooms, each of which has you know 30 bookshelves. Each shelf has has 30 books that have uh, some number of pages and some number of characters. Um, and most of these volumes are just filled with, uh, with gibberish, um, with random strings of characters. But every so often, a word pops up or a sentence pops up. But the 
as far as the inhabitants can tell, the library goes on indefinitely. There, there are rooms wherever. And so they reason that, in fact, uh, you know, somewhere in the library there must exist uh, all possible, uh, all possible books, all possible works of literature. Like monkeys and Shakespeare. Kind yes, of sort of. And and you know, you have somewhere there's the works of Shakespeare, and somewhere there's the works of Shakespeare in which all the tragedies have happy endings, uh, and somewhere there's the works of criticism on all of those. Um, and so basically, if you have a finite number of things and an infinite number of places to arrange them, then everything's got to recur. Including, you know, somewhere very far out there in the universe, there's uh, a replica of this conversation, um, and there's, you know, another replica of this conversation in uh, in which uh, Ava and I are occupying the opposite chairs, um, and uh, uh, and and one in which she's the <coughs> physicist and I'm the classicist, and and so, you know, thinking about this. Is, is very disturbing to any sort of notions of free will and good sense you might have. Um, but I think it, it's also a big part of, of thinking about parallel universes, just thinking about you know, what's there, even if there's one, if it goes on forever. I have a question. What's a universe? Is a universe all there is, or all that's under one system, or how? How does one speak about a universe? Right. So there are plenty of people who say that that you know the very phrase multiple right. universes or a multiverse makes no sense because universe by definition yeah. is unique. So, so under what description does it make sense? So you know I think that if I were really to talk about this idea of the inflationary multiverse where where things are popping off. I mean, if I were being very strict, I'd say that whole thing is the universe, and then we've got you know sub universes okay. within them. They're sometimes referred to as mini universes, but you know mini is <laughs> is much bigger than the entire universe we see, and maybe infinite. So it's an odd use of the word mini. But the um, but is it right or wrong to say that they're in the same space? In the case of of this inflationary picture. Um, I actually find this very hard to, to visualize, but I think that you know, there is some larger space that they sort of all inhabit, but each one within it has uh, you know, has its own, its own type space of, and set of yeah. set of clocks its own and type so of forth. Space or? Uh, potentially, because in in some versions of of this theory, you can even have different numbers of dimensions in these yeah. different universes. But if I, the, if I could um, just carry on one second yeah. more about this, when you talked about the beginning uh, and the expansion, right? yeah. In continuation of the questions I asked, <coughs> what does it expand into? Um, so uh, I, I have a, a, a canned answer to that question. But actually, I want to hear Dave's canned answer to this question, because I've been talking for a while. <laughs> to go back a minute and respond and to, to answer the first question you asked, the way, I, the way I use the word with my physics classes with my students is what I say is that for the, for the conversation where you start talking about other universes, the, the way to, to understand the meaning of the word universe, in my mind, is everything that we can observe or potentially observe, um, which means that if there is a part of the multiverse that is further away from us than light has had time to travel since our Big Bang, then that is legitimately another universe, because we can't even potentially hope to observe so it. So in principle, inaccessible to us. Yes, yeah. which also means, though, that if you accept that definition, you also have to accept, for example, that the inside of a black hole, inside the event horizon of a black hole, mm -hmm. because we can't ever potentially hope to observe that region of space, that region of space is another universe. It I, is a sort I of want to slightly challenge that, because you can always visit the interior, provided you're willing to go in. You just and can't come, come back, back out. out. Right. Well, so then it, then it raises the question of what it means to observe. Well, right? yes. so, um, so maybe it is uh, locally uh, within our universe to an observer inside the event horizon. But, uh, but when you start thinking about the expansion of the universe into some bigger space, it's difficult not to Im imagine our three-dimensional universe embedded in some sort of space that's higher dimensional. Um, the mathematics of the sort of theories of general relativity and cosmology don't demand that you do that. It doesn't demand that that, that external space exists. For example, if I blow up a balloon, um, that's a two-dimensional universe that's curved into three dimensions, expanding into the room, which is a three-dimensional space. Um, 
it's impossible not to visualize that expanding balloon that way. But mathematically, in general relativity, you can have the equations for a two-dimensional space expanding and you don't require the existence of that additional third dimension in order for it to make sense. It's just impossible for us as three-dimensional creatures trapped in a three-dimensional universe to visualize expansion without expanding into something. Is it possible to think it? Um, <coughs> if you believe that manipulating equations counts as thinking, then yes. I don't think it's possible to have a picture of it in your head. So when uh, when Einstein uh, developed his theory of gravity in 1915, that, that uh, brings in this idea of, of curved space. Um, so space in which the, you know, the shortest distance between two points is something more complicated than a, a straight line. And, the, uh, and allows a three-dimensional space to sort of curve back on itself in the same sense that, that the surface of a balloon cur curves back on itself. And the, um, uh, so, it can, so you could have a space that is finite, like the surface of the Earth, but is, doesn't have an edge to it. And, the, uh, and so in 1917, Einstein suggested the first modern cosmological model in which that was basically what the universe was like. And if you marched off in one direction, you would eventually come back to where you started. Um, and then another uh, 12, but he had the notion that this was static, that it was like a balloon just sitting there. Uh, and then 12 years later, Edwin Hubble discovered that no, the universe is actually expanding. Um, and that leads to this notion of the, the sort of expanding balloon with galaxies kind of painted on the surface. So if you stick to the balloon, um, then there's no place on the balloon that's the center of the expansion. Everything's moving away from everything else. So that's my, also my favorite analogy for, for what it means, the expansion of the universe means. The other one that's sometimes used is uh, to make things three-dimensional is if you imagine having a, a, a cake that's, that's filled with raisins and the raisins represent galaxies like the Milky Way and, and this cake is rising, um, then these things are, are all moving away from each other. This is sort of a good analogy if you have, for an infinite universe. So if the universe goes on infinitely in all directions, you can have an infinitely big raisin cake. Um, and, uh, and the only problem is you then need an infinitely big oven um, to, to put it in. But that, those would be the sort of two most common analogies, each of which you know, kind of in, in a different way circumvents the question of what, it, what is it it's expanding into, which, which really seems like not something that, that you know, logically the universe could be like that, but it doesn't actually appear to be. Who would have thought that cosmology was pure poetry? <laughs> <laughs> and would the answers be the same or similar for any talk about when this begins? Or you mean in occurs? terms of there being I mean, I think most commonly, if you're thinking about the sort of inflationary multiverse bubble universe, that there are in this sort of higher dimensional super space that our universe is just a bubble in, that this is constant, there are constantly big bangs happening all the time with bubbles coming and going. Um, but so I think coming back to this notion of beginning, um, there's so the thing that we know in the sense that, you know, we have extremely good empirical evidence for is that uh, 14 billion years ago, all the stuff that's in the part of the universe that we can observe was very close together, very tightly packed, very hot. Um, and that this was, so, so there was you know, this very hot, dense state of the universe 14 billion years ago. And that really is the Big Bang theory stated in a form that is empirically testable. Okay? And then you get to, to trying to understand, well, what could have preceded that state? And you know, back when the Big Bang Theory was developed, I think it would be you know, mostly that was just sort of accepted as the state that things began in, although there was also a notion of kind of cyclical universe, where maybe the, the universe expands and then recollapses and re-expands and recollapses. So then, in principle, you know, this chain of this cycle of, of expansion and recollapse could, could go back forever. Um, Inflation provides sort of one prehistory to the Big Bang in which you can start out with a universe that's kind of gross and lumpy. Um, and, and, it, uh, and it starts to undergo this exponential expansion that smooths it out. And then you have this transition to a hot young universe, um, or, or maybe to many. 
Uh, and in most versions of inflation, still there is actually some beginning of time, so, so that there is still some initial state. But there are also now uh, alternative versions of this kind of cyclic model in which uh, the universe is, is continually undergoing some kind of, of, uh, of cycle of, of new big bangs and, and expansion that, that you know, gradually dilutes things. And it's always tricky to talk about before the big bang anyway, because our universe is you know, three space dimensions and one time dimension. And in some sense, asking if the universe had a beginning, uh, asking what happened before the Big Bang is equivalent to asking the question, what's north of the North Pole? Once you get to the North Pole, the word north doesn't mean anything anymore. That the, north, the word north is about the, a certain direction within the coordinates on the Earth's surface. If before is a statement about uh, a certain direction within our universe in time, uh, and that there was a, there's a place where there's the origin of that coordinate system. The word before doesn't really have any meaning there anymore. So it becomes a very tricky thing to sort of sort out what that question, if that question even makes any sense. David, um, both. Uh, if, you're in, if you're talking about, the, say we're in the, in the Large Hadron Collider. I mean, like, like what you were saying before, I'm sure everybody, they're like me, they're going like, nice. But, you know, but if you see it on a kind of like micro, on a micro level rather than a macro level, is there some possibility here? I mean, are there instances in, in the kind of part, in the collisions where you see uh, uh, instances of, of, of uh, data that, that, that support some of this? Well, in terms of, so, you know, this idea of inflation, of this exponential expansion prehistory to our universe is one that's now very well supported by, by astronomical observations, because right. it makes predictions right. about the, the kinds of things that we're doing. The other formulations of the many worlds than the, yeah, and the yeah. So I think the problem with many worlds <laughs> is, is that, you know, it's, it, it, with, with that is that it's just not clear whether there is a way of experimentally distinguishing right. it from other interpretations. And the thing about, you know, infinite replicas is, we don't actually know whether the universe continues infinitely um, in, in some sort of homogeneous way, although you know, I would say current observations suggest that you know, probably uh, an infinite universe is, is a good bet. One piece, of, one piece of, uh, of evidence that could come from the Large Hadron Collider is evidence of these higher dimensions, that if our universe has three big dimensions and time and these six little dimensions, that in our universe didn't get inflated up, they're still sort of the size of quarks and electrons, um, that the ordinary forces in our universe, like electromagnetism and the nuclear force, don't work in these other six dimensions, but gravity may actually leak a little bit into these other six dimensions that are hidden in our universe. So there may be, the force of gravity may behave differently at the very, very small scale than it does at the large scale. And hints of this, some people think, could come out in experiments with the Large Hadron Collider, but I think it's, it's somewhat doubtful. But any, th there could be hints that our universe has more than this, the three easily visible dimension. I want to hear from the philosophers. Can well, I just ask a question? <laughs> I have a kind of uh, strange question, and it has never occurred to me until right now. <laughs> and I love this stuff, and I read about it all the time. Uh, but as I'm listening to you, I'm, and all these multiple universes and so on, what is, what is useful about this? <laughs> so. Uh, uh, so I'll, I want to. Can, can we? Can, yeah. Why don't we come back to can that we question? Come back That's to a that. Great that strikes me as a very powerful question. But maybe when the other disciplines have talked a little yeah. bit, I wanted to get back uh, to a little bit um, uh, before when you had established sort of a model of of three, and the first was the quantum mechanics sort of multiverse model, and the second was. Um, the expanding universe, there must be universes outside. What's interesting about those two is how extremely opposite they are. Because one is about um, uh, things that connect with each other at every possible infinite moment. And the other is about things that uh, can never connect. Um, and then you have your third model, which is, in some sense, a way of reconciling that, is saying, well, geez, we, we don't really want to think about things that can never connect. What could that even mean? So we imagine something where uh, we, we posit that just because of its enormous size, everything is going to, it's big enough to include everything, including any of the variations that we had thought about before. 
Um, and I was wondering just, um, and to, as you say, throw this over to the, open to the philosophers, you can see how these three models connect um, urgently with ways that human beings want to think about their own experience. Um, and I was wondering if, if if, if, in, if in your work or in, 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 in philosophy, there's a way in which uh, the, there are versions of these three models of, uh, in terms of thinking about the world, in terms of thinking about the meaning of the world. And what I'm glad think. he asked you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't yeah. counting on that one right away. I'll have to, I'll have to give that some more thought. Are there, are there analogs philosophically that correspond precisely to those categories that you set up. But I, I do think that, uh, well, to just reflect on, the, on my reflection since getting the invitation to come here, I'll sort of use that as a starting point and, uh, and share the space with my uh, very esteemed colleague who um, has real expertise in some of these areas. But I think you could tell from our questions, philosophers are um, deeply intrigued about questions of space and time. And I was trying to think about uh, listening to, so I get my, to get to, instead of just entirely deflecting the question, <laughs> I would say that my, my thoughts on how to begin to construct uh, a, a more suitable and satisfactory answer to your question would be one thing possibly to do is to look at how philosophers have thought about the stuff. I mean, philosophers, uh, early f philosophy that we take as part of the Western tradition has a cosmological orientation, and so reflecting about the nature uh, what is the stuff of nature, or is it stuff or not stuff? Um, questions about permanence and change, um, and you have a variety of a great variety of responses to that question. So, could we find some ways of categorizing them in those terms? Another possible way that that we could look at it through the history of philosophy to try to get some traction on an answer to your question about analogs to these cosmological theories might be to look at the different ways in which philosophers have thought about space and time. So some philosophers, for example, have uh, considered whether uh, the universe is reducible to one or the other. Is it more appropriate to think about the universe spatially uh, where temporality is is not real. So the question, when did it start, doesn't make any sense because time is really a product of human experience and not uh, ultimately real. Um, so one possible way of looking at it might be, and then there are the reverse. That in fact, there is no space. There are only these, there's only time and, and, uh, and its organization. So that might be, might be those would be my two, category, two categories for sifting through the history of philosophy to look for those analogs. Well, that's interesting because those those will also be theories that are hard to test in the laboratory. But, well, uh, certainly, <laughs> certainly. But if you, if for example, you had uh, a view about time, and I, this is not at all my area of expertise, but anticipating having to field some questions about uh, the cosmological dimensions of Nietzsche's. Uh, views about eternal recurrence, which is not my own reading of the primary purpose of that of that thought experiment, but I was uh, looking, sifting through some of the the work that Nietzsche would be reading um, from Hemholtz and uh, and uh, and others about. Uh, about the reality of time. So, you know, we say, well, we have empir hard empirical evidence that 14 billion years ago the Big Bang happened. But if, if it should turn out to be the case that um, time is this, how we measure time, I, I suppose maybe the cosmologist would be open to the notion, or maybe not. Uh, the, the question of whether this 14 billion, when you say there's hard empirical 14 evidence, testable evidence, 14 billion years ago um, that the Big Bang happened, is it, do, does the cosmological view concede 
quo, of course, there, it's somewhat arbitrary, the units of time that we use to measure these things as we, in our descriptions of them. Still, the, uh, the uh, mathematical calculations and observable facts that we use to arrive at that figure it <coughs> somehow has some more enduring quality to it. <coughs> Could you summarize for us the, the idea of uh, eternal recurrence? Um. Could I summarize? What, well, it, again, it does depend on what it is that you think uh, is the purpose of this, uh, the ultimate point of Nietzsche's speculation on this point. Is it offered as a cosmological thesis? Is it a, a, about uh, time and the repetition mm -hmm. of uh, of actual events, the eternal mm -hmm. repetition of actual events, or is or is it some other sort of test? So there's another strand of interpretation in Nietzsche studies that sees the eternal recurrence as sort of a a uh, well partly as a heuristic. Uh, you know, a useful idea for conceiving of other ideas, but also as an existential test. Would you, um, could you affirm in each and every moment that you would will this to return, um, to repeat itself eternally? Um, but, and how does he start get to this notion of things repeating over you know an infinite number of times because that's like how your, does how does this like come your third in? option right um, i think it's the time and, version of the third option in which you know the universe is infinite in time instead of infinite in space and there are actually other people writing around the same time talking about the infinite the infinite replicas in space notion but but how does to the extent that it's known historically how does Nietzsche arrive at, at eternal start, recurrence. How does he start to think about that? Um, I would say that my, my uh, own position on this at the moment is that um, it springs, it issues from his rejection of a metaphysics of being and stasis. Okay, so he, he, and he thinks that modern science is built on this basis of, of permanence, the, um, uh, a search for atomic and unchanging units that constitute stuff and their arrangements and so on. And he's very intrigued by um, the Heraclitan notion of constant change. And he, as, a, as an armchair scientist, obviously, is trying to imagine what would, what would it be possible to reconceive uh, uh, basic scientific principles from a metaphysics of becoming and of constant change uh, and flux? And so I think that's the beginning of the beginning of this idea um, that he is constantly wrestling with and is, you know, ultimately unprepared to give us a, a, a satisfactory scientific explanation. Could you have a could, could I ask a question about that, which has puzzled me a long time? Uh, um, what does Nietzsche have to say about the kind of causality that is circular? That's certainly not the deterministic causality we're used to, where one thing happens after another. And although each thing is uh, sufficiently caused by what came before, it doesn't have that vector. Right? How? What makes? What makes him think there can be circular causation? That is that snake, that Ouroboros that bites. It's a, a right that would allow it to that yeah. would I mean, allow it to yeah. actually repeat. You know, in yeah. physics, you need a. F you need a force to make a turn. What in, do you think made him think that he could find a causation which was on the one hand repetitive, but on the other, well, which was repetitive, yeah, rather than? Right, right. I'm not sure I can be Nietzsche's defender here uh, <laughs> on this question. However, I, I do. I do wonder, I have a colleague um, who has a book just out called The Death of 
Nietzsche's Zarathustra Paul Loeb. <laughs> And, uh, and by the way, the Journal of Nietzsche Studies will be reviewing it, so check out issue 40. Um, it has some wonderful contributions by Stanley Rosen and uh, other well-known uh, Nietzsche scholars. Paul has a very in Paul does think that there is the, that it has this cosmological thesis and uh, dimension to it. But he has a very interesting interpretation of how it functions in the context of thinking about an individual life. I'm not sure this answers your question, but it seems to me that one necessary uh, component to answering your question is you need a different sense of time in order to get, yeah. in order to, yeah. to have this explanation because it makes no sense to talk about it in the way that you initially described it in terms of the question sequentially, the before, the after, and so right. on. I, I don't think we're going to make sense of it that way. So it seems that you'll need a different conception of time. Now Paul's reading of uh, Nietzsche's idea about eternal recurrence and what it means to say yes, the, the affirmative moment, is that um, all of these, all of the, it's not as though you live your life out one step after the other, and then so it starts all over again. Simultaneous. You know, it's yeah. it's Groundhog Day yeah. all over again, yeah. or something yeah. like something to that effect. But that there is uh, there is sort of this um, there is this uh, situation in which all of these things all the have happened. Are present. Right. Yeah. That, that Simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And so the task of affirmation is not really about, you know, could I say yes at every moment? In fact, Paul wants to describe it in terms of recollection and memory. And uh, he yes. thinks this actually plays itself out yeah. in the text. Of and that is the character of memory and uh, expectation. They are all there at once, though one may not have them present at the moment. Right. right. Yeah, that, that's an ex that's a possible no, no explanation. No one's mentioning reincarnation. I mean, he was an anti-Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, wasn't there any kind of a, in, in, in formulation of the theory itself, a kind of anti-Christian, uh, you know, kind of a, trying to find an alternative universe to reincarnation? Well, that's that's certainly one certainly one possibility too. Um, I mean, it's not relevant to our discussion, really. But I mean, you were saying the, the, con the contextually. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there are some. You know, I've been reading recently Wagner's autobiographies, and uh, because I'm supposed to have something, I'm I'm not there yet. Um, reasonable to say about Nietzsche's uh, autobiography, Ecce Homo, and I've been really perplexed by the, um, the prevalence of Wagner in that text, even though the normal story about Nietzsche is, well, you know, he breaks with Wagner early on, shortly after the birth of tragedy. This coincides with his rejection of Schopenhauerian metaphysics, and, uh, you know, he takes jabs, he always sa ha says nasty things to say about Wagner thereafter, and so on. But the, Wagner is really all over uh, Ecce Homo, and I know you didn't ask me anything about Wagner, but Wagner did have this curious a set of ideas that he thought he took from Schopenhauer about the transmigration of, yeah. of souls and reincarnation. And there's a very important moment in the multiple versions of Wagner's autobiography where uh, he writes about the moment of Beethoven's death. And so he, he presents himself uh, without coming right out and saying it, you know, a bit of Beethoven jumped into him. And, uh, and we see in Nietzsche's... <laughs> Which we, part? <laughs> I don't know. And we see, I think, in Ecce Homo something very similar. Nietzsche takes great care to talk about the moment, the place, and the time of uh, Wagner's death. And so, uh, though I don't think, I don't think it was, um, I don't think it was uh, to Nietzsche's 
metaphysical taste to have a lot of speculation about the transmigration of souls. I, I do think we see hints of that uh, throughout the text. A, a few minutes ago, were you going to say something about will, that that is, is one of the ways in which um, uh, things could come back or return is through an effort of will? Um, uh, I wasn't going to say that, but we could talk about will some if you want to. I think I was talking about in the context of, oh, well, I did mention, um, I, of course I mentioned um, thinking about eternal recurrence in the context of affirmation and tying that to um, could you will uh, from the exit, if, if the, if the, I'm not, I'm, loathe to call it a thesis. I think it's really just an idea, the idea of eternal recurrence. I, d I don't think there is a theory or a worked out thesis um, that goes along with it. I think it's, a, it's an idea that Nietzsche experim holds experimentally and thinks about, considers what else it allows him to think. Um, but free will would foul it up good and proper, wouldn't it? What? Free will would foul up the idea of oh, the sure. term. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Could, would you consider this? Look, I mean, I'm just sort of fabricating here at the moment. But <laughs> what if, after all, the notion of eternal return is self-contradictory, right? Eternity and return and don't go together. Yes. What if it's Nietzsche's attempt to get eternity moving? <coughs> that, that is to overcome the notion of permanence and, and absoluteness, right. and, and the, if it's a deliberate self-contradiction for but that it, purpose. But it also might be the only way where, where we, how we can think about eternity, or con concepts like eternity, is by filling it up with repeating with versions points, of yeah. things that we yeah. already know. And it has, it has a certain um, experiential truth to it, right? That is, our life is all there every moment of it, so far as it's happened. Yeah. Right, and, you, and, and in the context of human life um, as such, it seems that it's uh, early in uh, human all to human, he just says, well, uh, different actors, same stage. You know, it's, it's the, we take the unique events of our life as though they were utterly Unique, and of course, from our perspective, they may well be, but um, the sorts of things that occur to us yeah. in the course of a human Good. life are remarkably similar and repeat. Yeah. What do you mean it's all, all there, though? I'm sorry. What do you mean by the last statement? By which it's, it's all there. Well, it's all there in the sense that everything, every moment that happened to us, uh, perhaps not literally, but great moments that happened to us, are there over and over every time the, uh, we reactivate the memory, there it is again. So, it, so it's not a causal sequence of events causal. so much as experiences put down in layers. Yeah. Layering. Um, I mean, what's interesting, I think, is that you can see how the cosmological models connect to um, urgent versions of our desire to think of ourselves and our experience in certain ways. Um, and these models also. Yeah. Um, the, I wonder the model that all experiences is, is happening at the same time and is connected to it. I mean, that's, that's very powerful. There are the model that um, uh, time is the thing that exists and space does not, or the model that space is the thing that exists that time, time does not. It seems to me that there's this is there there's there's a, there's a, a beyond thought experiment reason why people are thinking in those terms just in the same way that they're thinking about the science in those term those terms. It's because it fulfills uh, a way of thinking about the world that we're all familiar with. And um, we're f finding different ways, philosophical ways and scientific ways of trying to justify what we, the, the limits to what we can imagine about our own experience. And I think that way of thinking of time lends itself very, or, or Einstein's way of thinking about time lends, lends itself very, very well to that sort of, that kind of statement about, about uh, sort of everything that has happened to us 
is there all the time. I mean, it's very difficult to find in physics a reason that the past is different from the future, that, that time should only go in one direction, um, whereas space, we can go whatever direction we want. Um, time seems different from space in a way that the laws of physics don't really address, except for one law of physics. Most laws of physics don't care whether they go forward and backwards in time. Um, the only exception, that's the second law of thermodynamics, which has to do with entropy and heat and whatnot. Um, but because in relativity, uh, the notion of simultaneity of things happening at the same time is relative to different observers, uh, it makes very little sense to talk about a now for the entire universe. And it's entirely um, possible to think about a sort of world line through space time, thinking about uh, space and time simultaneously as, uh, as in independent of any notion of now for any particular observer looking at, at the world line of a, a particle or an individual from past to future as existing in a sort of four dimensional block of space time. So, all how the time. does that fit in with the notion of an absolute beginning? Um, I think that uh, that if you want to conceptualize the universe that way, that the universe would be a self-contained structure in space and time, and the beginning of it only has meaning sort of within that universe as, as your perception moves through time from past to future, but the universe sort of as a whole from outside that three-dimensional perspective of... Wouldn't have a beginning. Right, or the, the beginning would be like, you know, it would be equivalent to the North Pole being a special place on the Earth. You know, there's no place special about the North Pole except for when you spin the Earth, that's the place that doesn't move. Um, but if you go off the Earth and look at it without any latitude and longitude lines, there's no beginning to the surface of the Earth. You know, when you said about uh, the question, what's north of the North Pole, not making sense, I was reminded of something that St. Augustine says in the Confessions. Uh, uh, concerned, you know, he was much interested in beginnings, mm -hmm. creations, and uh, uh, he said that concerning questions, what did God do before, the question, what did God do before he made the world? The answer is he prepared a help for people who <laughs> asked dumb questions. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I teach. A, I team teach. That? Yes, yeah. I team teach a course on on science and religion at at, uh, at Eugene Line College at the New School with a professor from the religious studies um, program, and we read Augustine and articles about the Big Bang right next to each other, and yeah. oh, and they're often right? saying something very very similar about the notion of time and, and beginning. Um, the parallels are very very easy to find. We, we haven't heard much about Poincaré in this discussion. We, we, I have nothing to say about Poincaré. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, but Poincaré. Yeah. yeah. Nothing about Poincaré. No, no and not Ever from me. Yeah. <laughs> from them. For, we, we, uh, yeah, the, but, a, a recurrent, <laughs> recurrent theorem. Yeah. I, the, I look, Poincaré is sort of the mathematician's version of the Library of Babel. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that if you have some finite number of possible arrangements and an inf infinite number of opportunities to arrange them, then, then they all have to occur. Which actually did, uh, so and one other question I had about the, the eternal recurrence is, so what, when, when I was mentioning this idea of replicas in an infinite universe, I, I talked about also you know, all the alternative ones, you know, the, the Romeo and Juliet with a happy ending and so forth. So does, uh, mm -hmm. does Nietzsche, Think about that idea that you know you you come back to the recurrence, but but the next time through you do something else. Right. Mm. That does either deliberately or <laughs> or just because it's beyond your control. Right. Doesn't seem like there's a do-over. Okay. Uh, option. Um, but this this did lead me to to think about the multi. In thinking about the your claims about the, let's see, there was the many and the multi. Yeah. There's yeah. the many and the multi, mm -hmm. and the multi are and the. Let me see if I've got many is just a lot, and <laughs> and the multi are all the ones that have all uh, that would reflect all of the possible other decisions that That's atoms the could make. Worlds. That's, That's right. the many so, so, worlds. So the many would be things branching off from other things, and the multi would be you know, the sort of spatially separated Yes. And so I had a question about your take on, on these. 
And that is, so you, you described that as, uh, well, not your cup of tea. And, and part of it is because it lacks, um, in addition to lacking testability, it lacks, um, it's hard to know how any of these other multiple universes could have, you know, how do they measure up in terms of uh, predictability, at, which would presumably be part of what we wanted to know. And then you made an offhand comment that, well, there's a question as to whether these are, do these exist <coughs> simply mathematically or do they have some other existence in themselves? And I'm wondering what's your take on the ontological status of these alternative, uh, these other universes that could come out of these different atomic decisions? Well, I'm, it is an ontological question and not a scientific one, which is why I was going to ask you a very similar <laughs> question um, about, uh, about ideas from philosophy like modal realism, uh, which I think are very, very similar to um, <coughs> the many worlds interpretation of, of um, quantum mechanics. I would say that, that based on the definition I gave earlier about the word universe meaning everything that's observable or potentially observable, the, a corollary to that is any statement you make about other universes is by definition an unscientific statement because another universe is by definition unobservable, mm -hmm. which means there are no measurements you can make about it or predictions you could verify about it. So when we start speaking about other universes, um, if we accept this definition, we may be stepping outside the bounds of, of science entirely. So um, in that sense, there is no difference between the many worlds interpretation and any other interpretation you might have about quantum mechanics because we're confined to the measurements we can make in our own universe. Um, in which cases, whether these other universes are mathematical fictions or real other universes where things are really happening um, is, is not a question that has a scientific answer, therefore it's not a, a they're not different theories. Uh, they're just different uh, ways of thinking about one theory. So I want to redirect this line of questioning to Paul because mm -hmm. he hasn't had to say much yet. Um, <laughs> but you know, you brought up mathematical fiction. So before we were, when we were talking about fiction before, uh, uh, before we started, you mentioned this idea of, of uh, you know, the, the, the sort of books that you don't write but could have written. Um, and so this, so my notion is that that. I mean, that concept seemed to me closest to this sort of many worlds version of, of parallelism. That you know, every time you write, there's, there's all these choices that you know, maybe somewhere else in the universe there's someone writing the book that, mm. uh, that did it a different way. But um, well, would maybe, you agree with that characterization? Maybe as a segue, we could get back to your question, which we've left sort of hanging as what, what's the use of all this? Um, and for me, the use of it is, you know, with what I do. Um, and what fiction writers do is they try to dramatize and make real, um, I and mean, one of the things they try to do, dramatize and make real abstract concepts. And so you can see in fiction writing, uh, entire genres that correspond to these various ideas and various theories. So there's an entire genre of story that exists in a um, universe that we can't get to, or a world we can't do, get to, an experience that we can't get to. Uh, there's an entire genre of story in which here we are and we go over there and then we come back. Uh, there's an entire genre of story um, where they're, uh, where we're connected to infinite possibilities as we move through the story. Um, but even if you're not dealing with stories that intentionally distort or expand our ideas about the world we live in, even when you're just writing realistic fiction. So your job is to say, I'm going to hold up a mirror to our experience of the world so we can recognize the things that are hidden from us because we're in the middle of it or whatever, however you want to imagine it. Um, that is already uh, a 
an exploration of a parallel universe. Um, for a couple of specific reasons. Um, one is, it's a universe where there's a god. Um, you, the writer. Uh, and there are also, there's a universe also that exists as a description of points of view that vary from some objective reality. But in this universe, there is an objective reality because you're a god and you made it. And so that you're aware of that, you're aware also of how every character in the narrative lives in an entirely separate but parallel world. Um, you're aware also because what you've put together is, you know, because otherwise readers wouldn't stand for it for a minute, a causal sequence of events. You're aware of how artificial that is and how untrue that is in some sense to our own experience, which is um, laid down in layers rather than sequential. You know, so that, you know, the, the typical example is that in, in stories and novels, um, memory often exists as a kind of an interlude. So people are doing things, they're saying things, they stop saying something, they stop doing the thing, and they have a memory, and the memory is sort of laid down as a piece of narrative for expository purposes. But we know from our own experience that that's not how memory works, that, there's ne that memory isn't some separate or new part of thinking. It's something that's happening simultaneously with everything else. There's never a point where we're not uh, uh, remembering. So that any writer knows that in order to put together something that will remind the reader of their experience requires a certain level of falsehood and a certain level of artifice that makes it so that it's happening in a parallel universe, as if it's in a stage set or something like that. Um, Independent of that, there's the experience of the writer, and this gets back to what you were saying. Um, the writer starts with an image, a created image of a book, often. And then there's this crappy little thing that they're doing. Um, and after a while, the crappy little thing, you know, you got nothing and you add nothing to it and you add nothing to it and pretty soon you got something. It's, um, uh, after a while, that becomes the sort of center of gravity and it sucks all your intentions for the book away from, away from it. And that becomes like a shadow version of the book that's always with you and gradually sort of dissipates as you, as you sort of understand the thing that you have. And after a while you switch over and say, well, you know what, this is never going to be like this. I don't even care about this anymore. Let's try to make this something. Um, independent of that, because you're the god, you recognize how there's infinite potentiality in this thing that you're doing. And some of that potentiality is a potentiality of will, where you say, okay, well, uh, do I want this character to do this or that? Does he marry the girl? Does he hit the girl with the hammer? You know, what? Um, I mean, <laughs> um, uh, well, or <laughs> indeed, why not? Why not? Or one after the other, or you know, marry her first, hit her. Or, you know, you can see immediately how, <laughs> how. Um, but but so that there, so it's connected in terms of causal sequences, and every time you make a choice, you can see how. The, the story could go in a whole other direction that now exists only in potentiality, and yet is still with you as you write. And you're always going, well, heck, I should have had her, had him beaner, <laughs> but, but I didn't. Now, she, now they're married and happy. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but also, I mean, and that's a matter of causality, but it's also, a, you can also do it as a matter of just, you know, there's a, there's a version of the story where I put my hand down, and there's a version of the story where I do it ten seconds later, and that that and that confuses your conception of the story. Although you have to make a choice at every moment, and so it doesn't. So the actual story is much more clear than your idea of it, because your idea of it is made up of these sequences of slightly different parallel versions of it. Um, and as I say, that's just when you're writing realism. Mm -hmm. 
when you're writing something that's intentionally distort distorted, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's a version of going to a movie about virtual reality. Well, there's a doubling quality to it because when you go down and sit in a movie theater and the lights go dark and everybody's sort of plugged into the same data stream, that's already, even if you're watching a documentary, that's already an experience in virtual reality. So that if it then becomes about virtual reality, it becomes a sort of a, meta, a, a metafictional commentary on itself by its nature. Well, anytime you distort deliberately the world that you're writing about, it has that quality too, because it's already a distortion. Although now the uh, distortion is not in order to duplicate the reality of the world in a way that people will recognize it. It has another, another um, uh, reason for it. So, you know, I write mostly stories of that kind that are where the reality of the story is distorted in some way. And there are categories of that. So I've written, say, historical fiction. And the point of the historical fiction could be um, there's a secret history to events that we recognize, and I'm going to tell them to you. So that it's so it's you're playing on, on the on the version of meaning. So you're taking events that might not have any objective meaning, and you're giving a pattern of meaning to them. Um, or you could change history in some way. And you know, there's a whole category of stories that are alternate history where they imagine what would happen if either some enormous powerful event had not happened or had happened differently, or else some incredibly minor event that you wouldn't think that would have enormous consequences but in fact does. I mean, there's a whole theory that suggests that even any tiny thing that you change has enormous consequences. Um, well, that's in all in all science fiction about travel, time travel too. Of course. Not mine, but in many, yeah. <laughs> but it's true. You know, it's the sort of beating, you know, crushing the butter, stepping backwards and crushing the butterfly, and the world comes to an end. And, um, I have a question uh, about um, you, you talked about this the the process of writing as almost sort of enacting this multiple universe realization where you're sort of choosing the path at any given moment, mm -hmm. um, and just thinking about. In modern, and thinking about from the consumer's end, that consumers of fiction usually just get the finished product. But now, in the sort of era of hypertext and thinking specifically about film, where I could go to Netflix and download or, or order three different versions of Blade Runner where three completely different things happen at the end, um, do you think that changes our experience of that if the consumer gets to? gets to have that kind of choice, does it, does it change our experience of fiction in a negative way? Um, or does that? Well, I, I mean, I, that's, uh, that's mostly a question about taste. Um, well, but I'm thinking more about the intent of the author, that, uh, that if you don't get to choose which the final version is. I, I mean, my feeling is that the, the reason people are reading books is because they want to get, they don't want to make those choices. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they plunk down their hard money for somebody else to make those choices. Right. Um, and it doesn't make them happy to, to imagine that things could easily have gone in some completely different way. Um, because even though, I mean, the difference between, you know, one of the difference between books and real life is that books are usually or often plotted in a way that real life isn't. Okay. Uh, and even though everybody knows that's an artifice, it's, you know, from a, you know, from a point of view of a search for meaning, it's mm -hmm. an important artifice, and it's right. an artifice that reassures people. If at the end you say, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet could have easily had a happy ending, that doesn't feel satisfying in terms of the whole, um, it just makes it, it makes it seem arbitrary. Because, and, and all of a sudden it makes it seem as if actual characters and actual choices that people make in, along the sequence of events don't mean anything. Ed, um, I, I had a question for Ed here. Ed, is this what did you find that, in, in that like what he's describing with fiction writing is what patients do in the creation of narrative? I mean, the, pa the patient narrative writing is creating a narrative. Well, one is creating a narrative all the time, and so yes. But I have a uh, your comments made me think of something, and that is when you write, even if you write about things that we don't have an experience of. In order for us to enjoy what you have written, we have to, in some way, understand it and imagine it. Sure. 
what these guys are talking about, not only it's hard to understand it, unless you really dig into it deeply and deeply, but some of it is just hard to imagine. Yeah. And that's so when I ask the question to them, what's the use of it, is because they're talking about things that it just, even they have some difficulty. You said there's some of the uh, theories currently being presented. You yourself have difficulty imagining it. So in that context, how, what you see is? Well, I think, to, uh, I think something you just said and something you just said, I think I can connect very well to, to what I find unsatisfying about the, uh, about the many worlds interpretation of, of quantum mechanics is that um, you know, right now we're all, I think, missing the World Cup uh, U.S. Yes, versus England game, a, right? That's a disaster. Um, suppose, suppose, <laughs> well, suppose you were, you were, um, you were rooting. You, suppose that's right. Suppose you're rooting for the U.S. to to win I'm its uh, its its match today, and um, and they they didn't. They lost to England. Um, if you believe in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, it's entirely possible that you could say, well, we know that there are many, many universes in which the US did win their match today against England. Um, that is no consolation to you, though, I would imagine. That, that, that knowledge. If you convince me that it was true. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think even for the people who believe it, it's no consolation that, you know, oh, in some other universe, I won the lottery yesterday. And, and I, you know, uh, and I think that goes back to what you were saying about uh, not that the way a book turns out should be the, not, not being satisfied by the idea that a book or a movie can have many different versions that, that we want that we only care about the one, uh, the one sort of experience of, of a work of fiction. I think we only care about our, our experience in the universe and are sort of not uh, comforted or, if anything, disturbed by the idea of these sort of parallel many worlds uh, in which other things happen than, than that thing that, that we perceive. Yeah, because in the, I mean, we're invested in the idea that it's important whether we like what happens or not. We're invested in the idea that it's important that things turn out the it way happened. they have to turn out. Right. And if, if that's disturbed in some way, and you say, oh, well, you know, there, there are an infinite number of, of ways in which they have turned out in some completely different way. Um, uh, I don't think that feeds us, right. or feeds our, 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 our quest for, for establishing some kind of meaning in events. And certainly for a fiction writer, that's what you're looking for on some level, because that's what people respond to. What about exploration? I think some of this, though, touches also on the issue of limitation. In other words, you talk about infinity and so on, but there's a limitation to what we are really capable of thinking. Yeah. Well, yes. yes. But, well, and <laughs> or not. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's a very sort of Kantian notion of knowledge, right? But which but, I basically subscribe to. I think it did but, come up but, in our discussions about time, the sorts of questions you can ask about, you know, what well, what happened right. before? Well. At some point, you run up against a limit where that question doesn't make any sense. Now, maybe you get rid of the question by just saying, well, you dissolve it by saying, oh, well, it doesn't make any sense to ask it. Or perhaps we can't ask it because there we have run upon, hit upon a limit that is simply inconceivable to us. It's not, may not necessarily be just that it's not a viable question because it's a nonsense question, but because it's yeah, just unthinkable. Where, where does the notion come from that everything that's mathematically intelligible is also interpretable? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, you know, clearly it's not necessarily. I mean, you may be able to, to manipulate things and, and, you know, come up with equations whose, whose interpretation you don't understand or whose interpretation you don't understand at some point, but you know, later it becomes clear, um, or where there are multiple possible interpretations of, of the same thing. Um, and, the, um, in, uh, and so you can have you know, things that are very good quantitative descriptions of the universe, but, but you, you don't necessarily know what they mean. Um, although, uh, you know, so, uh, but the history of the subject is that sometimes you know something makes no sense for a long period of time, and, and then you know something happens and it starts to make sense. So, I wanted to give a somewhat different answer to your question about you know what what use is it? Um, so we've sort of talked about well, what use are these things from the point of view of human experience, and there's also the question of well, are 
is this notion of, uh, are, are these notions um, useful scientifically? And I think, uh, you know, David's criticism, which I pretty much agree with, of, of the, the many worlds uh, issue of quantum mechanics is that the problem is from a scientific point of view, it's not clear that it's useful and, and you know, I'll, I'll, in the sense that, you know, as scientists, we tend to, in the end, care about whether something makes a prediction, you know, allows us to, to explain something. So this idea of, of, of multiple universes uh, and that might be rooted in, in this uh, eternally inflating universe is one where, so on the one hand, there's lots of papers written about it, um, but there's also a lot of debate as to whether this is or is not a scientific idea. I should say that, that although I'm a cosmologist, um, I'm, a, I'm an empirical cosmologist with the result that I, I really mostly worry about our universe and the, the parts we can observe of it, so I'm sort of a spectator on this field. But, you know, the, um, so there are some arguments that, well, these things are not scientific theories because these other universes are not observable even in principle. But, you know, so, so there are two ways in which we might nonetheless convince ourselves that they exist. So one is we might end up at an, an understanding of, of microphysics, of the way particles interact and so forth, that clearly has this as a logical consequence. So, you know, it, it, we, we just, uh, we're not in that state, but we're, you know, we sort of think of it as a reasonable possibility because there are plausible ideas about microphysics from which it would be a logical consequence. And, you know, maybe we get to the point where we'd say, yeah, you know, it's pretty clear that physics works this way. And if it does, then, then this is what's going to happen and, and this would be what, what we'd expect. But the other question is whether it has explanatory power. And this sort of goes to the, the very na notion of, of explanation in physics. Um, so we live on a planet with liquid water, um, and this requires fairly special uh, circumstances. You know, we, we, you have to, to be just the right distance from the right kind of star, and and um, in order for there to be liquid water, um, and without liquid water, life, you know, at least of the sort that that we know, couldn't exist. So this seems very lucky uh, until you think, well, actually, there's lots of stars out there. There's lots of planets. And you know, maybe uh, only 1 100th one of 1% 1 of them have liquid water. But if there's enough of them, then you know, it shouldn't be surprising that, the, uh, that uh, living beings come around on the ones that, that are lucky enough to have water. Um, so, uh, so this is a perfectly reasonable explanation for why we live on a planet with liquid water. Um, now, when you look at the universe, there are, uh, you know, there are other things about the, the constants of nature and the stability of atoms that uh, if you change things a little bit, uh, you wouldn't be able to have the kinds of atoms that we have. And therefore, you know, at least life that's anything like, like we are couldn't exist. Um, and the, uh, you know, so one possibility is that, that you know, it's, it's just luck that the, the laws of physics allow the existence of life, or that it's divine intervention that the laws of physics uh, allow the existence of life, or Another possibility, and this is where uh, you know, people do appeal to this multiverse notion, is that much like the planets, you know, there's actually all these universes out there. And they, they try out all of these different possibilities. And most of them are sterile because they, uh, because they don't have physics that allows uh, galaxies to form and planets to form and life to develop. Um, and again, it's no surprise that you, know, you, you happen to find yourself in, in a universe that's, that's hospitable to life. Um, so this, this is sort of used as a possible explanation of why our physical laws are like they are, um, particularly in this notion of, in this context of string theory, where it seems like there would be so many possible ways that physics could work out. Um, I sort of hope it, it I, I like the idea of the multiverse mostly because of this kind of diversity it implies that, you know, there are other worlds out there that are, you know, so far beyond what we could ever possibly imagine um, and that they all are sort of out there and, and exist. So I find that very appealing. Uh, from the point of view of, uh, of these uh, so-called anthropic explanations for, for the nature of physics, um, I think they may be 
correct. I would sort of prefer that they're not be, not correct because it's it's basically giving up. It's saying you know that that there are these things we don't understand about fundamental physics, and you know we never will because they're they're actually sort of frozen accidents um, that happen to come out some particular way. So it, but this is how people are using the idea and the, and how. People are thinking that it might have, have scientifically testable consequences. Um, but it's a very fierce debate within the scientific community as to whether this whole way of explanation is, is legitimate and whether you know, these things should be characterized as, uh, as science or not. Is there any rule that says that if you have a large enough number, everything has to happen once? Um, yes, what? Everything has to happen once? Uh, uh, well, I think it comes. Uh, so this was the Poincaré recurrence oh, uh, theorem, right? That that the. Um, so I think it's, you know, under certain conditions that's true, but it basic, uh, you know, it depends on whether there's a sort of finite number of ways of arranging things. He so said it only came close, right? He said, it, it, said that you know, if you've got a continuous range of things, so there's there's not some discrete set of ways of you know that that everything will always come close, but. Yeah, um, but uh, let, let's open this up to questions. But I, I want to make one sort of pseudo observation first, which is, you know, it's interesting that both both these both these categories, the science and the philosophy, or and the fiction as well, um, breaks down on the concept of how we can imagine things that we can't imagine, mm -hmm. um, and so. For the, the physics, you've got one model that's almost too close. It's unimaginable because it's too tangled up. Um, uh, and the other is unimaginable because it's like we can't get there. We can't even think about it. Um, and so you have to have a third that suggests, well, it is infinite, and yet it's filled with stuff that we recognize because that's the way it's got to be. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see also in, a, uh, in fiction how it is that even though writers all the time posits things that are, you know, worlds that are infinitely far away, even so, it's filled with stuff that we recognize. And there's obviously a, a good practical reason for that, but there's also a, a, a obvious conceptual reason for that. So it's filled with things that resonate with our own experience in one way or another, either challenges it or reinforces it in some way. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's a failure of imagination, I think, in both, like a built-in failure of imagination in both cases. Um, People, uh, if you would like to come up and now address the panel, ask questions, uh, you, we have two microphones, and just we invite you to come up. Just say who you are. Uh, I used to be a former teacher. Uh, you've been dealing with abstract notions that you say may be in principle or difficult to understand, but haven't we been dealing with this for thousands of years in the notion of the soul, of heaven, all these things that we can't really get a handle on, that we've been struggling with and have more or less given up on. So and you're continuing it in your way. Well, so I think that, that uh, and this also relates to your comment of, of you know, in what sense are these things unimaginable? And uh, the fact that they're far away, I don't think makes them unimaginable. I think it's, it's the fact that they're far away from our, our everyday experience. And I think that you know, our, we can imagine things that are that are far away from our personal experience. But the things we can imagine are, are nonetheless sort of extrapolated in some way from our everyday experience. And you know, so, so typical notions of heaven or, or the soul, that they we're still trying to you know, in, in some way build them on our, our everyday experience. Do you that you can imagine heaven and imagine the soul? Or is this really a, a construct of of ethereal, no uh, right. So I think that the way people have tried to imagine them is always something that's that's mm. taking off in some way from from their experience. And when I think about these universes being unimaginable, it's mostly because you know they would be so far from any experience I've got mm. that that I couldn't get to that. And I think the um, you know in terms of these notions of. You know, so when we think about the beginning of the universe and the nature of, of time, then you know the, the question of whether the, you know that notion has any meaning is it sort of ties back to 
you know, our, our notions of time are still tied to our everyday experience. And you know, maybe it's, so based on our everyday experience, it's always a perfectly reasonable question to say, well, what happened before that? But it's not clear that it's, it's reasonable to ask the question, what happened before the Big Bang? Um, we don't quite know. It seems reasonable, but, but that was a situation very different from our everyday remote. experience. How can the uh, scientific community, in particular the physicists, uh, discipline themselves not to go into metaphysics rather than physics. I think some of them do a very bad job of it, actually. And I think that one of the one of the things you have to be very careful of when when reading accounts of of this sort of 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 um, cosmology and string theory is is um, to really make sure that the scientists are being clear when they cross the line from speaking about scientific theories to speculating. I think some authors. Um, and I won't name any names, but aren't always as clear as they should be when they stop doing science and start speculating. So I think that there's a line there that, that you have to be careful um, not to cross, or at least be careful enough to tell people when you're crossing it that that's what you've done. That now I'm not talking about established theory anymore, now I'm going to speculate about things that are outside the sort of bounds of imaginable possible verification. We have another question here. Yeah. Um, you are. Uh, Greg Purcell, I'm a writer. Uh, I guess this is about um, this is uh, how best to speculate. That is to say, we um, we have on one hand like a very satisfying mythopoetic version of parallel universes in which um, you throw a magical book into a fire and voila, parallel universe. Or you have a magical knife that can cut through parallel universes, and that's all fun. Uh, and then we have the uh, by necessity skeptical version of, of how uh, parallel universes would work. Is it advisable to try to wed those, or should we just continue down the two tracks? That is to say, if you wanted to be, a, is there a hard science fictional way to write about parallel universes? And I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, I, I don't think anybody's done it very successfully and uh, you know they're just uh, fiction is inherently I think a conservative art form because it requires such sustained attention um, and you're not going to get that unless you use as a vocabulary things that um, resonate with people's experience I, I you know and that in a way, it's frustrating because you can always, you can always, when what you're trying to do is trying to is think of something completely new, or that even is a metaphor for the unknowable, you know, um, uh, you feel yourself limited by a vocabulary that's going to resonate with people's experience. Um, and I think part of the problem is, from a hard science fiction standpoint, is, is all the versions of multiple universes we've been talking about are, by definition, inaccessible to one another. That's what makes them a universe. I mean, by the definitions we've been talking about, whether they're inaccessible quantum mechanically because they're two different branches or, or cosmologically because they're in um, separate places. So I think that, that if that's what a universe is, then jumping from one to another is, by definition, um, supernatural. I know that probably a lot of people, any Lost fans? There gotta be some Lost fans if you're here for a thing on Parallel Universe, right? Um, uh, that the, in the season finale of Lost, the flash sideways timeline was revealed to be supernatural. It wasn't another universe that they were in. It was some sort of heaven purgatory kind of supernatural thing and Jack dies and goes to heaven. Um, and so they cheated in terms of, of uh, treating this parallel universe scientifically. But I think you have to cheat because, um, because everything we've been talking about sort of suggests that if there is another universe that they're by definition, no way to, to sort of jump from one to another. And, and they're also, I mean, uh, much of the science, I think, and as you were talking about the, the shift into metaphysics, much of the science builds itself into thing, uh, from things that are, appear mathematically possible rather than experientially possible to conceive, even when you're talking about you know, ten, 10 dimensions or string theory. And I think that, then you, uh, the, the, the concepts outstrip our ability to visualize things. Um, and that's always a problem when you're trying to describe something. Well, that's partly true. But I think also, you, you know, 
So I was saying that, that our intuition is built on, on our everyday experience, and so it's hard to imagine things that are very far from everyday experience. But I would say one of the roles, you know, a role that fiction plays is, you know, that actually you read stories and and those actually, you know, now become part of the, the sort of set of experiences that, that you can, yeah. mm. you know, you can branch off from yeah. and you can say, well, you know, this, I, uh, you know, I can understand this by analogy to, you know, this book, which in turn I understood by analogy to this. And I think actually, um, you know, the process of uh, certainly of learning physics, and I expect, you know, many other technical fields is, is you just, um, you know, there are these things that might, that will seem you know, counterintuitive to most people, uh, like, you know, the passage of time depending on your speed or something, but, but you just uh, go through this, it's part of training, go through this kind of series of, of stories or experiments or, or, or problems that sort of add those to your experience mm -hmm. in the same kind of way that, you know, fiction adds to your, your mental experience. So those things start being, you know, not counterintuitive. So there's plenty of things about, you know, black holes and relativity that, you know, would have seemed counterintuitive to me 30 years ago, but seem, you know, perfectly intuitive to me now because I've sort of built that, that you know, kind of mental uh, everyday experience for it to, to tie to. <coughs> I just wanted to say, my name is Nancy Muir, and at listening to this uh, whole uh, roundtable discussion, I kept thinking of Doctor Who, <laughs> and I kept thinking, you need a time traveler here to explain this so we can all understand it. <laughs> Well, time travel is a place where, where this sort of alternate timeline idea of, 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 of alternate universes comes up a lot. Because if you accept that time travel is possible and you can do things in the past that are different than what really happened, then you're naturally led to this idea of an alternate universe. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best time travel writing is, is time travel writing in which that doesn't happen, in which traveling through time, you just sort of actuate events that had already happened in the past and the timelines never change. But time travel and alternate universes are, are connected in a way that's, that's yeah, inseparable. Yeah, that's question, yeah. um, if, What's your name? My name is Daniel Gill. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, as you're saying, if ta a space curves in a dimension that isn't one of the three that we generally think of or use or for, um, and it curves and is expanding, if not as fast as it once was still, and if it doubles every trillionth of a trillionth of a second, or once did, that is relatively, at least, over the speed of light. There are places in the expanding universe that aren't observable and never, and potentially never will be, because we, it's fasting the speed of light. If it's cyclical and it may eventually contract, these places may eventually become observable in the future. And if they did, is this contact between a different universe, or is this simply irrelevant? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great question. So, it is a really good question. So all of these things uh, are, arise in, in modern cosmological discussion. So, so the first thing about the speed of light is, you know, there's, there's this uh, law in relativity, but it's based on empirical fact that things don't go faster than the speed of light. But this is a, a sort of local statement that, that you can't have something go by, you know, something else nearby faster than the speed of light. It is actually possible in a, in a uh, expanding universe to have things that are that are far separate from each other that are actually moving apart from each other at a speed faster than the speed of light. So, so the expansion of the universe in this way doesn't. Um, uh, it, you can have these these things that are moving apart faster than the speed of light without actually violating this this rule that things don't pass by each other faster than the speed of light locally. Now those things that are moving away. Um, faster than the speed of light. Uh, Are they if, universes? Well, so, so this sort of came back to a, a definition that, that David gave at the beginning of, of you know, he's saying, well, it's just the, 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 the end of the universe, so certainly the end of the observable universe is uh, the thing that's, that's sufficiently distant that there hasn't been time for light to, to get to you. So there are things which, if the expansion of the universe continues to speed up, so something that's moving faster, moving away from us faster than the speed of light now, will always be so in the future. Yeah. 
then that means that you know those things are gone in in that that we'll never be able to communicate with them in the future. And we appear to actually live in such an accelerating universe, and that that there are things we got to see in the past that we we no longer have time to ever send a, a signal to. Logically, the universe could be different. It could stop and we collapse, in which case you're absolutely right. Everything sort of comes back together and eventually you get to, to reconnect with everything. And you know, when I was a graduate student, this was the big question, is whether the universe was going to stop and recollapse so we'd be able to get back in contact with everybody or whether it was going to expand forever. And it looks like it's the latter. And either way, if it continually expands and accelerates at that, or if it eventually comes back and um, deflates, Either way, the observable universe changes. Either you get, get to see less and less or eventually more. So does that mean the universe, the observable universe is getting smaller? Uh, yes. Thank the, you. Uh, under the, the universe that we observe is getting smaller. Yes. So. May I ask one from back here? Come on, come on up. That's what we need to lower. People are listening. <laughs> um, Howard, you're, Howard, you're an attorney in New York. Um, what are Clark and uh, Kubrick saying in, uh, about these questions? Um, what, what was um, Clark's original story that 2001 Space Odyssey was based on? I, I don't the Sentinel. The Sentinel. Right. What is Clark saying in The Sentinel about this? And what, what is Kubrick saying in the film? I mean, that had a great impact on my generation, at least, and dealt with fiction and the philosophy and the physics. I think all in one, kind of great, great stuff. But what, I wonder what the panel thinks uh, those guys are saying about these issues in those works. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure he's saying anything about parallel universes specifically, but I, the way I've always personally interpreted the, um, the ending of the film uh, version of 2001, which is somewhat different from the ending of the, the book, um, is that it's very much similar to this idea of the um, of our experience in time being something that's that's extended. In the end, when you have Dave Bowman uh, coming out of the ship into the sort of hotel room that the aliens created, and he sees himself in eating dinner, and then the and he sees himself in bed, that that sort of that moment in the film is is Dave Bowman experiencing some huge expanse of time in his life simultaneously that 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 he is sort of beyond this linear perception of time that we have um, and has moved into some sort of perception of time where he's able to perceive time um, all at once. So I think that's the closest thing to what we've been saying today that's, that's, uh, that's happening in those films. And again, and that's just sort of the way I've always interpreted those five minutes at the end of, of A Space Odyssey. Well, I wanted to ask if this film is popular among Nietzsche scholars since it's, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it does seem to be very, at least the film, you know, very explicitly going to ideas of Superman and you know, choosing Thus Spake Zarathustra for the, the music. I mean, I, I feel like uh, Kubrick is trying to, to get there. So do, do the Nietzsche fans ignore this as best they can or like it or hate it? So it seems. The architecture at the end of that film is a 17th uh, century period of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Not something that comes up often in uh, the Journal of Nietzsche Studies or academic conferences. I'll have to, you know, I'll have to think about that. The so it's basically ignored as far as the Nietzsche. Well, when you say often, do you mean ever? <laughs> well, I, 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 well, I, I wouldn't. Uh, it's I, I wouldn't make a universal claim, but uh, it's, it lies outside of my experience if, if it's occurred. Let me say. Sorry, have you seen? I have not seen. I have not seen the film. Did you ever read the story? And did not read the story. So maybe it's coming up and I don't even know it. Before we, uh, I don't want to stop us, but we have wonderful thinking here and wonderful books for sale by some of these thinkers. So avail yourselves of them. I don't want to, if anyone else would like to say something. There's a question. Yes, come on up. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Mena, perplexed mortal. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually have. Two questions, one for you. You brought up this, this idea of Shakespeare and how you could have different possible endings in different possible worlds. And we also hear about uh, um, language, where you can construct a sentence, uh, infinite number of sentences, by just adding a conjunction or something like that. 
Uh, and then, of course, counting, we could always add one. So my question, on for, I'm sorry, is about infinity. Um, there's also a notion of, of arrangements of molecules. So if you took arrangements of molecules, is that infinite or is that uh, finite? And I know, of course, the universe is, is expanding, but we don't know if that's going to be an infinite expansion. But let's just assume we're talking about um, a world like ours existing somewhere else. Um, is it possible to arrange all of those molecules so that we have different arrangements of matter uh, in a finite universe that will count all possibilities, but then is it also a paradox because we have things like language where you can construct infinite numbers of sentences and books with you know, possibly infinite number of endings? Isn't there a serious problem there with, um, with, with these two notions? The notions of matter on the one hand and the notions of these intellectual notions on the other? So I actually don't know what the, of, of the people who do worry about this question of infinite replicas in cosmology, I actually don't know what the, the current thinking is on whether you would in fact get these replicas in an infinite universe precisely because I'm not sure what the, uh, about this question of, if, if you really thought sort of classically about molecules, they're you know, discrete things you can arrange in some discrete number of ways, and it would seem like you'd have to get all these replicas. But if you, if you actually think about them quantum mechanically, where there's this sort of more continuous description, it's not, it's not so clear that that holds. But the, um, you know, the notion of, of, but this thing about um, countability, uh, is is certainly an important one if you try to to uh, you know, figure this out uh, at least in a a rigorous way. And so, in going back to the the Library of Babel, which I actually reread last night in <laughs> thinking about this panel, um, the uh, you know it's it's actually quite important there that that there are books that are of a fixed length. You know, they all have the same number of characters, and and it's and therefore you know all books that are you know, exactly that number of characters will appear, but, but all the other ones won't. So actually, once you've written that book, you're not allowed to add a conjunction because there isn't room. Um, and the, uh, and there's, it also, you know, the narrator of this story says, um, well, uh, uh, he's sure that, that uh, you know, no book occurs twice. Every book occurs. But the library isn't infinite. He thinks it actually cycles back onto itself. Um, and so uh, you know, that would actually give you uh, some, you know, f from that information, if you assume those things to be true, you could actually calculate exactly how big the library has to be for, for every one of these possible things to occur. But, it, um, you know, but it's, it's driven by the fact that that you know, he has set things up in this sort of circumscribed way where things are a particular length and there's a particular set of characters. And you're right that as soon as you add you know, one bit of freedom to that, you, know, you add an extra page, the library is much, much, much bigger. Yeah, I just had a quick, a quick one about the many worlds. Is do, do, do scientists or theorists in this case um, claim causal? Connections between these worlds, or are they just separately existing? There, <coughs> once they split, they can have no causal connection to one another. I mean, there's the, sort of the whole basis of the idea is that quantum mechanics has an element to it that's non-causal. That if I have this radioactive carbon-14 atom that wants to decay because it's unstable, there's nothing that makes it decay. It just sometimes decays. So the non-causal element of quantum mechanics is what leads us to this whole probabilistic interpretation in the first place. So the idea is every time that happens, the wave function of the universe or the universe itself, depending if you want to think about it sort of in the abstract or in the concrete, splits into these two parallel universes and because they are now separate wave functions of the whole universe, they cannot interact with each other anymore. So there can't be any communication between the many worlds um, because that, that event that defined them has already happened. So they can split off, but they can't split back. 
They can't take a split that would bring them back together. Yeah, what, what, I mean, the, the sort of official uh, word that would be used in quantum mechanics is that they decohere with one another. They're considered separate <laughs> universes once their wave functions are sort of far enough apart that they don't interfere with one another anymore. And that's a, something that happens locally. It kind of doesn't have to happen with the whole universe at once. It can happen locally at different parts of the universe when these things happen. But Again, the, the, the basis of it being an interpretation rather than a theory in and of itself is that the whole point is that they must be non-interfering or else they would be, there would be some way for us to find them, which right. we can't do. Karen, before you go, I'll always be waiting and then you're going to turn. Can you prove that it's not a causal? Maybe you just don't know the cause. Is there a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, there are some theorems that say, you know, pretty much if there are sort of hidden causal elements to it, certain experiments would turn out in different ways, and they don't. So, yeah. Okay. I would like to ask a question about fluctuation theory. It's um, uh, when you talked about entropy. Um, that's uh, w what you said. Uh, it's uh, the, for everybody to understand. It's simply second law thermodynamic of thermodynamics saying that. Uh, heat cannot go from uh, cold air body to hotter body. Heat on, only goes in one way, from hot to cold. So, but um, there were uh, some experiments, observable experiments, where uh, high velocity and high energy particles steal energy from low velocity and low energy particles. And they create fluctuation theorem. And it means that on this level of reality, um, energy could go in both ways. So time is symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And I still, when people talking about time, I still uh, hear about entropy, not about this fluctuation theorem. So what's the reason? Is it, uh, what, what the question? Well, the, I mean, the difference is really between the microscopic and the macroscopic. Uh, the microscopic laws of physics don't care which direction time goes. And Maxwell himself talks about this in his um, you know, his, some of his thought experiments, like Maxwell's demon, that if you can see all the individual molecules and know where they are and know what they're doing, uh, those molecules can do the same thing forward and backwards. <coughs> if you're only talking about one or two or three or four of them, it's when we talk about a trillion trillion molecules and can no longer trace their individual paths that describing them one at a time becomes useless because we can't keep track of a trillion trillion molecules. We have to talk about them in bulk. And as soon as you start talking about atoms and molecules in bulk, the laws of thermodynamics apply um, because the laws of thermodynamics are a probabilistic generalization of what things do sort of on the small scale. So there's this disconnect between our understanding of what happens to matter on the small scale and on the macroscopic scale. And somewhere in that disconnect, uh, the second law of thermodynamics happens and the difference between past and future happens at the same time. But but, uh, this question of uh, you know, fluctuations is, is an important one because, uh, you know, as Dave said, that these laws of thermodynamics are ultimately probabilistic. It's about what's likely to happen. And so it is physically possible for you know, all of the air molecules in this room to rush up into that corner. They would fit. Um, and you know, we don't usually worry about it because uh, it's just very improbable. Uh, on the other hand, if you actually have this infinite universe, then you know, not only are there all the replicas of, of uh, you know, this conversation occurring other places, there are the replicas in which all the air molecules do actually decide to end up in the rest of the room and that corner of the room and the, you know, the rest of us are left gasping for air. So the, um, uh, so it is, and, and people actually worry about this problem in thinking about you know, these infinite universes because one of the things that you know, in principle can happen, it's just extremely, extremely improbable, is that you know, sort of chance arrangement of atoms produces a, you know, a computer that happens to have you know, exactly the same memories in it as you know, your brain at this instant. Um, and the, uh, you know, but then immediately thereafter, the universe doesn't make any sense to that, that brain. So, so there are actually, I was going to say respectable papers, but papers by respectable people <laughs> <laughs> written on this question of so-called Boltzmann brains arising out of these fluctuations that basically violate the, the increase of entropy 
because the increase of entropy is something that's you know a law, but it's really you know just a very very good idea. It's it's something that's that's almost always happens, but you know things can actually go the other way. We do want to have time to sell some books, so uh, we have one last question. Quick. Yeah, quick question, and that's it. <laughs> Um, at least one physicist here brought up a piece of literature in talking about this this uh, topic today. But ordinarily, do philosophers and physicists talk to each other about these issues, or are you Only like here. totally what? Only here. Only a philosopher. <laughs> uh, or or is it? I mean, it, it, I mean, is it just today actually that you share information, you know, share ideas? Ordinarily, are you working in very different realms, or do you influence? One another at all. I, I want the philosophers to answer first. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have no idea whether my uh, colleagues spend time reading philosophy or hang out with philosophers at parties, but uh, I think philosophy has, in its current incarnation, uh, is has gone through a period of. Uh, lots of speculation about scientific matters. And so there's a debate in philosophy about whether philosophical inquiry ought to have, uh, it ought to be um, having truck with an empirical basis. It's, uh, you can, if you Google X fill for experimental, EX, not like X files, but EX, um, Phil, you'll find a group of philosophers who are, uh, they've gone through a period of writing manifestos about this and now they're, now they're trying to conduct some, uh, some research in the area. Would you say that it's true, in, in general way true, that f uh, professional philosophers are more interested in cognition than in physics? As at, the moment, science? Yeah. at the at moment, yeah. At the moment, certainly, yeah. certainly. Well, thank you very much, everybody. This is great.